Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. The disciples had a common argument. Which one of us is the greatest? And this comes up numerous times throughout the gospel accounts. At one point, I think James and John even have their mother go and try to schmooze Jesus into giving one or both of her sons like seats on either side of him in the coming kingdom of heaven. Jesus, meanwhile, is exemplifying the polar opposite line of thinking. Not only is Jesus a rabbi culturally who's worthy of esteem and respect, who instead chooses to adorn himself with a towel, assuming the outward presentation of the lowest caste in society. He's also the son of God who would go to the cross, Roman crucifixion, the most brutal and humiliating form of capital punishment reserved for the worst of criminals. And in front of this example of the greatest making himself the least, they had the opposite line of thinking. They wanted to think of themselves as the greatest, and they would argue among themselves over who was the greatest. Here's Luke 22, beginning in verse 24. Then a dispute also arose among them about who should be considered the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who have authority over them have themselves called benefactors. So these Gentile kings would lord over their subjects and live and breathe, identify themselves by their power over others. But even those rulers had benefactors who actually were the puppet masters. So the, the word benefactors appears in scare quotes here for a reason, because they're not really benefactors. This, uh, this was... This was basically corrupt, corrupt politics. They had donors and those donors had agendas. I'll give to your campaign if you do what I want you to do. See, even though this text is 2000 years old and originally written in a different language and comes from a different culture, it is not out of date at all. This happens today. This is still going on. All right, there's these things called lobbyists, <laughs> these special interest groups. And the benefactors aren't really benefactors. They're giving with an agenda. Herod did this. It was bizarre. He, as we talked about in a sermon a couple of weeks ago, once gave like a six foot tall golden grapevine replete with clusters of golden grapes for the temple. And then he would kill lots of Jews. Every, every Herod seemed to have like this genocidal streak. And it was bizarre, like a rich abusive husband. That's not a benefactor at all. That's not actually a gift. That's a means of manipulation. Watch out for this, not only in modern day politics, but in your own heart, in your own life, receiving gifts from people who have an agenda. What they're actually trying to do is control um, on, a, on a smaller scale, but perhaps a more common, uh, a common manifestation of this practice. Um, parents of adult children who are married, do not try to wield control over them with your finances. Let them rise and fall, give them support if they need it, but give without expecting any return. Um, be careful giving loans to family. Be sure that that relationship is not corrupted by finances. Remember, the original institution of marriage is that a man would leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two would become one flesh. So stay out of your kids' marriages and don't mingle your finances with your kids' finances. Let your kids be fully financially autonomous, all right? That is one of the best things you can do for them. Don't try to be one of these quote unquote, scare quote benefactors like this. So they're having an argument over who's the greatest. Jesus shows how the kings of Gentiles do this, but even those, even those governors, those kings have benefactors who aren't actually benefactors. It's a, it's a, it shows how that is the wrong game to play. You're not, not supposed to crave greatness and crave tyrannical control. That's the wrong dynamic. It's the wrong trajectory for your life. If you crave power over other people, check your own heart. Check your own heart. Okay, look at what's going on in your own heart. Jesus instead shows something opposite. The New Testament uh, epistles teach us the opposite, that we're to consider others before ourselves. Look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. Not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. 
If this is your whole agenda and social media to make yourself the greatest, to put out a feed that shows everybody like, I live a really rich and opulent, awesome life and it's better than yours. All right, you're trying to sh d display yourself as the greatest. It's the polar opposite kind of thinking that, uh, that we're supposed to have. So that's a, that's a losing proposition. Whoever wants, wants to become the greatest must actually become the least. It is not to be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever is the greatest among you should become like the youngest and whoever leads like the one serving. For who is greater, the one at the table or the one serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So he's pointing out to them. I'm like, I have demonstrated this for you. He's also just washed the disciples' feet. There's no more lowly a task, no more gross, hygienically, like a, a, a gesture. And this is something that Jesus did for his disciples, including Judas. You are those who stood by me in my trials. I bestow on you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So instead of exonerating themselves, lording authority over others, they're to emulate Jesus, who made himself the least, made himself lowly, and he served his disciples. He served others. He washed their feet instead of trying to promote themselves and boost themselves and argue over who is the greatest, rather they should trust in Jesus. Jesus had incredible plans for them. I believe this is also partly why it was so important that there were 12 disciples. They are the chosen 12. They're the ones that Jesus would refer to as those you have given me. When praying for his disciples in John chapter 17, uh, a text that comes the same night as this chapter of Luke. The only one that Jesus lost was the one who was preordained before the foundations of the earth to betray Jesus. And when Judas would end his own life, as the resurrection and the ascension have taken place and uh, the disciples, now officially apostles, uh, carry out the ministry, they know there, there should be 12 of them. And so they cast lots to determine which among this larger group of disciples who had been there since the baptism of Jesus should take the place of Judas. And they arrive at Matthias. There must be 12, and I believe it's for this reason, they were appointed to rule over and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. This is something that's even reflected in the architecture of the heavenly city. The number 12 is, is built into, literally built into, um, the heavenly city. There are 12 gates in the city of uh, heaven, each made out of a solid pearl. The, the names of the tribes are even there. The number 12 is important to God. So they, they didn't know this. As they argued among themselves over who was the greatest, they didn't know that God already had plans to lift them up. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up at the proper time. Perhaps after you have suffered a little while, Jesus refers to his own trials, his own sufferings. Indeed, the Savior's life is something that was marked by loss, grief, trial, suffering. You are those who stood by me in my trials. Would you stand by Jesus in trial? If you do this, if you emulate Jesus, take on the polar opposite of the modern cultural ethic of self-exaltation, and instead, become like Jesus. Be lowly. Be willing to be humbled, humbling yourself before the Lord. Right? Then you'll experience this. Then I saw thrones and I saw people seated on them who were given authority to judge. This is Revelation 20 verse 4. I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and who had not accepted the mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So what Jesus prophesies uh, in the Gospel of Luke um, is parallel with prophecies in the book of Revelation. May we not exalt ourselves. May we humble ourselves and let the Lord be the one who lifts us up at the proper time. Amen.